10 allowed. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about the sort of the introduction to our Genesis story. Now, it may seem a little bit weird that in Core 3 we actually started with the Exodus story, and now finally we're moving back to the Genesis story. Uh, well, the reason we decided to do that was uh, the Exodus story itself is the beginning of the Hebrew people, the beginning of uh, the Jewish nation that we have. And so that's their formative years, the Exodus story. And it is from those formative years that we get these stories here, these stories of creation um, and the other stories that you read about in Genesis. And so um, the reason we started off with the Exodus story was we wanted to start off with the start of the Hebrew people. And so now we're moving to the stories that the Hebrew people told um, to explain the world around them. And so I'll be calling these stories mythologies. Now, for some of us, mythology means something that's false, a story that's not true. Uh, well, the actual definition of mythology is a little bit more complex than that. And I have two different definitions here um, of mythology. A myth um, is a story that is embodying and declaring a pattern of relationship between humanity and other forms of life and the environment. In other words, it's a story explaining the world around you, something that we tell ourselves um, that helps us understand what, what is around us. And then Plato gives us a definition of what mythology is, the telling of tales customarily containing legendary characters such as gods, goddesses, heroes, and our revered ancestors. So you can see that not necessarily um, when we're talking about mythologies are we talking about untrue stories but rather we're talking about stories that help us explain the world around us. Now, um, the creation stories that we have in Genesis um, had a lot of different influences from the world around them. Um, obviously, the, the Hebrew people were in a cultural context, surrounded by the Babylonians. We've been pounding that into your head for the past two or three weeks. Um, these are actually just some creation stories or stories that have elements of creation in them. And so we can see from Mesopotamia there's quite a few different stories there. These are mostly Babylonian. And then obviously from Egypt as well. Um, if the Hebrews arose from the uh, Egyptian nation, they would have borrowed some of their um, creation stories. And so in Egypt, a lot of the creation stories were centered around particular cities. And so these are the names of the cities uh, that these uh, stories come from. Now I wanted to focus in on the Enuma Elish. This is um, a seven tablet story that we have from Babylon and uh, it tells of the story of creation for the Babylonians. And what I wanted to do is um, actually just recount that story for us. And if you'd like, because you really don't need to take notes on this kind of story, but if you'd like, just close your eyes and try and envision what's going on in this story here. The Babylonian creation epic tells how, before the formation of heaven and earth, nothing existed except water. This primal generative element was identified with the god Apsu, the male personification of the primeval sweet water or fresh water, and with the female associate Tiamat, the primordial salt water ocean. Now these represented a, now Tiamat represented a ferocious monster. From the commingling of these two different types of waters were born divine offspring. These in turn gave birth to a second generation of gods, and the process was repeated successively six times. Then came a time when the young gods, through their unremitting and noisy revelry, disturbed the peace of Tiamat and Apsu. The latter decided to destroy the gods. 
But the evil design was thwarted by the quick action of the all-wise Ea, the earth water god. Now Tiamat planned revenge and organized her forces for the attack on the gods. The latter, for their part, requested Marduk to lead them in battle. He ascended, provided that he be granted sovereignty over the universe. To this condition, the assembly of the gods readily agreed, and Marduk, invested with the insignia of royalty, thereupon became their champion and took up the fight against Tiamat. After a fierce battle in which he, defended the enemy for, he defeated the enemy forces and slew Tiamat, Marduk sliced the carcass of the monster in two and created one half, a firmament in the heaven, and the other, the foundation of the earth. The work of creation having thus begun, Marduk then established the heavenly bodies, each in its place. This activity is described on the fifth tablet, which is actually cracked into a million different pieces, and so much of it is missing. Now, Marduk decided to create man to free the gods from the toil in which they were placed. And so, using the blood of Kingu, Tiamat's second husband, Marduk created humanity. The gods showed their gratitude to Marduk by building for him a great shrine in the city of Babylon. So that's the story of the Enuma Elish. And if you're listening, you might have heard some similarities between the story of Genesis. And this is right here is just a picture depicting Tiamat and Marduk, Marduk attacking Tiamat. So I wanted to do an actually a direct comparison. And on your handout there, you can see it's laid out side by side next to each other. And what you can see here is that in the Genesis story, you have the waters being separated and a section of the waters being established above the earth, above the sky, in the heavens, and then a section of the water being established below the earth. And then God calling that the expanse or sky. And the Hebrew word that's used there is actually just sky water. Um, you can see that in the Enuma Elish as well. When Marduk cuts Tiamat in half, and if you remember, Tiamat is the um, primordial saltwater ocean, the, the chaotic waters. Cuts her in half and puts her up in a firmament and then below the earth as well. 